Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. I'm Tigris Osborne. I'm the chair of the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance, otherwise known as NAFA. And you are with us today for the NAFA webinar series. We are super excited for this um, special Pride Month edition. And um, today we have the editors of the exciting and well-received and groundbreaking anthology, Fat and Queer. And they're gonna be talking to us about their journey to getting this book published, a little bit about who they are as writers and artists before, and then reading some selections from the book. So we're gonna um, jump in with that in just one minute. I just wanna say a couple of um, things for those of you, especially for those of you who are new to the NAFA webinar series. This webinar series is brought to you free of charge because of the generosity of our members and supporters. If that is something that you would like to contribute to, you can do so at nafa.org. Just click the contribute button at the top of the screen. You should also visit nafa.org because it's full of fun information and important information about events and activities going on in fat community, um, the voices of people in our community, especially as highlighted through the NAFA Community Voices blog, um, and all kinds of other things. Um, we've also just wrapped up our first ever Fat Liberation Month. So you can check us out on social media at NAFA official or check the Fat Liberation hashtag on your Fat Liberation Month hashtag on your favorite social media sites to see what other people were doing for Fat Liberation Month. Um, and, uh, and we are still in the midst of planning our summer webinar series. So I don't have an announcement for you quite yet, but we have some exciting things in the works. So you can always find out what's coming up on the webinar series by following us on Facebook, where we post all of our webinars as events, or by following um, or by visiting the NAFA website at nafa.org and just looking under the webinar section. Before I introduce our special guest today, I would like to introduce you to David and Selena from Pro Bono ASL, who are our ASL interpreters for today's session. Thank you, David and Selena. And thank you to the entire team at Pro Bono ASL for all of the ways they support us and for all of the ways they support accessibility in the world. Please do check them out at probonoasl.com. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the editors of Fat and Queer. Um, we have with us today, Bruce Owens Graham, uh, Miguel M. Morales, and Tiff Joshua T.J. Ferentini. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about their bios when, they, when we get to each of them reading. So we're just gonna jump right in um, with Bruce and Miguel and T.J. telling us a little bit about how they came to be this super team of editors bringing us this incredible anthology. Um, who would like to start? Uh, I guess I'll, I'll go. <laughs> it's okay with everyone else. Um, so how did we become this super team? Um, well, baby, we were born this way. Um, no, sorry, I've been listening to Orville Peck's cover of Born This Way a lot today. Sorry about that. Anyways, um, so I wrote an essay for the Rumpus uh, called Gang... Uh, what is it called again? Dropping Fictions and Gaining Visibility, um, which was the first time I ever wrote about uh, fatness and uh, my queerness. Um, I guess really together at all. Um, and then after that, and luckily it was very well received, um, I had the opportunity to write a, a essay series called Fat and Queer. And as I was working on that, um, you know, I kept thinking like, well, you know, I don't want to be the only voice of this, um, that uh, there should be uh, an opportunity to hear from other voices. And uh, my original intention had been for there to be <laughs> uh, a lot, the series to, re to, to run longer than it did. But when I was thinking about that, uh, who would I want to invite? Miguel was the first person uh, I thought of. Um, and so I asked him and he said, yes. Um, and we had talked about uh, the series going a little longer and then for a variety of reasons it didn't. Um, so Miguel was like, well, we should do an anthology. Um, and I was like, that's a great idea. How do we do that? Because <laughs> um, we had never done that before. Um, 
so uh you know there's there was a lot of uh, website building and plans and all that um and so we announced the that we were going to uh do this book and we didn't have a publisher when we first announced that we were doing this that him and i were doing this um and then as we were working on it and getting submissions we were like um so um i i've mentioned this in other talks we've given about this so i know we got one mind him and i are very similar in our uh, we like the idea of organization, but we don't, <laughs> we're not necessarily very good at implementing it. <laughs> um, so as you can imagine, that's a little tricky when you're dealing with a deadline and, um, you know, after we got our publisher um, and all these submissions and we're like, we, and we also wanted to bring someone, um, we wanted, you, you know, a trans non-binary voice to be an editor as well. Um, so we were like, okay, who do we know that's really great organization and is trans and non-binary and that we both like working with TJ was like, that was, it was like, and so luckily, um, luckily he said yes, or they said yes. So, um, here we are. <laughs> it makes it sound so easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> it does make it sound so easy. Miguel, was it easy? Um, the idea was really easy. The um, the vision to get to where we were was really easy. It was doing the hard work and a, a lot of things that we didn't know that we didn't know. And so each one of us brought a skill that the other one didn't have because um, that's what makes us a super team of editors because if any one of us was not in this team, this book would still be an idea. Uh, and so I really have to thank TJ for for bringing their skills of organization and their spreadsheets and just like, I'll send that email. We're like, oh, great. Because I'm the kind of person like, you know, I'll send that email and I'll start drafting it. And then tomorrow I got to go to work. And then, I, oh shoot, I forgot to send that email today. I'll send it tomorrow. So <laughs> before you know it, you know, you're behind on submissions and we haven't gone through all the mall. So, um, so I really appreciate having a, a third person to like keep me and, and, and Bruce like on track because life gets in the way and and uh, and TJ just doesn't put up with that. So <laughs> they're like, let's do it. We're, we're, we're do, we've got the time, let's do it now. So um, that was really great. But um, so it was, it was difficult. Oh, go Sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, I was just saying it, it was just kind of like a, a difficult process because putting together a book, you hear from other writers and they make it sound so easy. And so during this process, we we discovered a lot of things that people don't talk about when they write books. And we kind of put together a list of things that we needed to know. And we kind of share that with other people and we did a workshop on it. Um, but I mean, I, I think TJ can, can fill in how, what they did to, to rev up this team for us. Yeah. It sounds like you sweep, swooped in and saved the day on some things. Like there was a lot of great work being done. And then TJ, it sounds like you kind of swooped in and tied it all up a little bit. How did, what was that process like? Um, sure. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, my, so my day job, I do, um, I, I'm an editor for a publishing company, so I already kind of had that background and I have been told before that the spreadsheets I use to kind of keep track of my work are, um, aggressively color coded. Um, so the good news is I was able to, um, we were able to like, you know, apply a lot of those skills that I had learned from that, um, and kind of figure out, okay, so like, how can we kind of look at the submissions that we have right now, how can we break it down and get back to people, do rounds of edits for the folks that we want to accept. And um, that really like the submission process of like going through submissions and then finding who we wanted to accept to include in the anthology um, and then doing edits with that was just an incredibly fulfilling experience because we all read everything together as a group. Um, but if one piece in particular really resonated with one of us we would be like hey I really love this writer can I work on with them for like you know a couple rounds of edits to like get this across the finish line um and you know that was just incredibly fulfilling and that's kind of how we broke down um uh like polishing up and doing like edits with um the contributors that we ended up selecting um but I also just to kind of boomerang back um you know as as Bruce said you know when this project did come to fruition that you know they we came up with the anthology before we had, like the publisher and just Bruce and Miguel are like 
social media superstars. Um, we have a website, Fat and Queer, which you can find um, links to purchase, you know, the anthology. Um, you'll see that all of us are wearing this really cool Fat and Queer t-shirt, which you can purchase on the website. <laughs> and it is because of the website and all that social media um, campaigning and work um, that, like, our publisher found us and that reached out to us. Um, so really just really have to champion Bruce and Miguel because they have really been um, working their magic on social media, not only before, um, you know, as the anthology was developing, as we were accepting submissions, but now that it's out. So uh, just really need to um, shout out that stellar work. <laughs> That's great. And you all are, um, and what's the social media handle? I know the website is justfatandqueer.com, right? Right. And then our social media handle for, oh, well, for Twitter, it's uh, just at, it's just at Fat and Queer. And then Instagram is Fat and Queer Book. Were you surprised that people, that no one already had Fat and Queer as a domain or as a Twitter handle? Uh, kind of. <laughs> I was like, oh, I wanted that one. Um, but originally, like, so I, we reversed it and it was like queer and fat when I, um, when we couldn't get the fat and queer one, but then when we we're getting closer to the book coming out, it's like, that's going to be confusing. Like, is it fat and queer? Is it queer and fat? Like, you know, like, let's just try to make it as streamlined as possible. But be like, yeah, this is us. This is, <laughs> um, but that was before, like, even, I don't know. Our Instagram was really quiet for a long time because there was no book. And then when we started getting closer to the book and we able to post more specific things about it. All of a sudden it was, I had to turn off my notifications because it was just like, you know, constantly like, oh, okay. I mean, it's great. Like, I love it. Like, it's not a complaint, but it's just, um, it's, you know, it gets uh, distracting at a certain point. <laughs> so we, so it's been about three weeks since the publication date, right? And it was published in numerous countries all over the yeah. world, which is um, a little bit unique to publications, right? Yeah, and that's one of the things we really were excited about with our publisher is that uh, it would be day and date around the world, um, you know, because usually you sell rights to, you know, for specific territories or con uh, countries, um, and, you know, and some books never make it out of one uh, sort of market, um, so we really liked that we would immediately have uh, global uh, availability because, you know, it's not just an American issue. <laughs> you know, like there are fat and queer people all over the world. We wanted them to have access to it. So um, that was really exciting for us to be able to have it all out at the same time everywhere. Is there also global representation amongst the 33 total writers, including the three of you? Um, not as much as we would have liked. Uh, I mean, we love the contributors we have. Um, but I mean, I think because our uh, established audiences for the three of us are, are all based in the United States. Um, so I think that's where uh, most of the people saw our uh, calls. Um, so, you know, we've, we've talked about the idea of doing a second one, a second anthology. Um, so that would be hopefully something where we would have more glow, uh, contributors from around the world um, because now it's you know in Italy and Japan and Australia and <laughs> you know, all these places That's I never amazing. thought yeah um, never thought I would be like you know we have a we had a bookstore in Australia contact us um, about how they could order it and I was like what <laughs> it's like here's our publisher like please <laughs> Are you going to yeah, do the t-shirts? Uh, the t-shirts are super popular. I know we're here to focus on the book, but I saw the t-shirts before I knew about the book, and I know that that's true for some other people. Are y'all going to do the t-shirts in other languages, too? We could. We haven't really... We're kind of focusing on getting marketing the book out there, but, you know, there's... The life of the book can be supplemented through, you know, t-shirts and pins and things like that. And there is there is a need for representation that people can put, wear on their bodies and put on their lapel and things like that. So it's not out of the question that we would, you know, want to do that. And, and any of the proceeds would go back into the book and hopefully to contributors. I just, I did, I did want to say that our publisher is based in the UK. So that made it easier to, to hit the international market because um, 
to them, the United States is an international market. So, and there was a little bit of complications about um, in the editing process because in, uh, in the UK, they don't have fair use. So a lot of the pieces that people would, some of the pieces people submitted wanted to use fair use, like a, a part of a speech that was public. And then we kind of had like trace it down and, and work on that. So there's just some differences with an international publisher than there are with a domestic publisher that we weren't aware of. So that's just one of the other things that we had to add to the list is, okay, when you work with an international publisher, things are slightly different. So just be aware of that. So, yeah. And before we, I, I wanna move us um, pretty soon into hearing y'all and your work from the book. Um, but before we do that, we're gonna get to know you a little bit during this session. Um, what do you wanna tell us about the other contributors? Wow, they are essential voices, uh, not only in the queer community, but in the fat community, and in the Venn diagram of fat and queer, and uh, a community that's that's starting to grow and, and, and flourish. And we've got established people, and we've got people who it is their very first time writing and putting their thoughts on paper. And each one of those is just as important as the other. I mean, we didn't, we didn't value one voice more than another because everyone has a different story to tell and just the breadth, the depth of the stories that we were able to, to shelter was wonderful. And the work that people sent that didn't make it into the, into the anthology was also pretty incredible. Um, and we hope that they found homes in other places or maybe just keep following us because if there is another anthology, maybe we can rehome those pieces. But I, I, I don't know what, Tip and Bruce have to say about our contributors. I was just going to say that it, what's so spectacular about this anthology is that when you read it, like it's it's so palpable that every single writer who is in the anthology like wrote specifically for it about the intersectionality of their fatness and their queerness. And this this anthology absolutely would not exist without their voices in it. Um, and at Miguel's point, you know, that we have a mix of both established and um, up and coming writers. Um, for me, just one of the one of the things that was so incredibly like humbling and moving was when people were getting their copies, like seeing them post about it on like Instagram and Twitter and just seeing people like cry and be like, this is my first work. I've never seen my work in print before. Um, and then just just knowing that this book serves as like the platform that is like, you know, a home for their writing is just so um, incredibly heartwarming, uh, especially when like, you know, you're, you're working on a book for as, as long as we did. And, you know, it, when it stays in your mind for too long, you're kind of like, how are people going to respond to this? You know, you, you know, you almost wonder if, um, you know, it's not that it's, you know, only you that's passionate about it, but, you know, you're kind of like, oh, I wonder if it's going to hit people the same way that it hit us, that it hit these contributors. Um, and that's one thing that we've definitely seen um, within the past couple of weeks as the book has been released. And and what kind of, what are you hearing from people about how it's hitting them? Um, I think, for, uh, oh man, I don't know why I suddenly can't speak, but anyways, um, you know, that they finally get to see themselves on the page, you know, that, um, and that it's a celebration, that it's not, uh, I mean, that was really important for us too when we were going through submissions is, you know, some of the pieces that Miguel was talking about where, uh, you know, fat and queer, being fat and queer is not easy. Um, you know, and so there were some pieces that really um, told some really heartbreaking stories and not that those stories aren't important, but for this, especially this being the fir first book of its kind, we really wanted it to be a celebration. Um, so I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of joy around the book, even though there's, you know, there's still some difficult stories within the book, um, you know, but there's always like, okay, how ultimately it comes back to a celebration of being fat and queer, which, um, you know, we, we still don't see enough um, of either of those things, especially, um, you know, you know, people want to be, be celebratory outside of June. <laughs> you know, their queerness, um, you know, and now, and you know, and now May for their fatness. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's been that's been really great. 
when we initially told people that we were going to do this, they would say, I will buy that book right now. So that that told me we had something because we were just still kicking around the idea and like hadn't even put out the call for submissions that people were like, I will buy that book three times. Um, so and then it took a long, you know, then we put it together during a pandemic and we were like, what are we doing? We need to <laughs> we're trying to stay alive, but also like put this out there and encounter the narratives of COVID and being, you know, heavy and fat. And so it was just a lot to deal with. And so thankfully, working on this, on this anthology really helped put a light on the tunnel for me and focus um, to get through the awfulness of, of the pandemic. And now that we seem to be coming out of it somehow for the book to be there for so many people who are emerging from their homes and worrying about, oh, did I put on too much weight? Did I do this? Well, guess what? Here, here's a book. Take it to the beach, read it, and, you know, be as fat and as queer as you want to be. So don't worry about the COVID-15 or 25 or whatever you put on. So yeah. we, we did a lot of work in April around um, talking to people in fat studies and public health and just um, brilliant fat activists around the impacts of COVID-19 specifically on fat folks. And I can't tell you how much it is wonderful and beautiful to have something so fat affirming um, like you said, like that people are walking out of quarantine and into this, into bookstores where this is on the shelves. Um, and, you know, and so many other great fat books and projects and visibility things, um, but that this one is so obviously intersectional, you know, some some works you have to get into them before you can see how intersectional they are, but this is right out there, right out there for you in the front. And so we're all um, grateful for this in community. I want to move us into the reading so folks can hear from y'all about, you know, hear the pieces that you all have. And um, an audience, I'll just remind you if you're here with us live, there'll be a little bit of time for Q&A after the reading. So we're gonna actually, uh, we're gonna have TJ start first. And uh, Tiff Joshua T.J. Farentini is an editor at Penguin Random House, marketing manager for Monkey, new writing from Japan, and one of the co-editors of Fat and Queer, an anthology of queer and trans bodies and lives. A 2014 graduate of Manhattanville College's MFA program and a 2019 Lambda Literary Emerging Writers Fellow, T.J.'s writing has appeared in The Gambler, off the Rocks, the LGBTQ anthology of Newton Writers Press, Songs of My Selfie, an anthology of millennial writing, and Fat and Queer. They live in New York and can be found on Twitter and Instagram at Ferentini, F-E-R-E-N-T-E-E-N-Y. TJ, please bless us with your work. Um, thank you so much, Igress, for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you again to Pro Bono ASL for the interpretation this evening. Um, I think, you know, now in this era where more events such as these are either going to be, um, you know, hybrid or, you know, leaning towards a more virtual scale, um, I think it's just so important um, for, you know, to have accommodations um, for accessibility. So it's so incredibly um, exciting um, to see you here this evening. Um, so I'm going to read uh, an excerpt of my essay, which appears in Fat and Queer. It's entitled Enough, um, and the essay is broken into um, numbered sections. Uh, so I will just be reading a few sections from the middle of the essay. Eight. I weighed 125 pounds in high school, and I told myself I was fat because my, father, my mother acted as if I was. She never called me fat, not directly, but instead would always encourage and prod me to lose weight that I needed to. The doctor says you should be 110 or 115 pounds. I'm not saying it's not hard. I've been on a diet my whole life, I know. You don't wanna wind up having all these health problems like those we have in the family. My mother always had her nose in a new diet book or magazine, humming and hawing whenever she found whatever sounded like the next best fad to make you lose the most weight the fastest without ever even trying said diet first. By high school, both of our relationships with Weight Watchers had been on and off. And by the time I had started college, we had moved on to Jenny Craig. Jenny Craig had managed to help me keep the freshman 15 off, but it soon turned into another failed diet. And by the time I had reached my college heaviest, I was over 160 pounds. One weekend when I had returned home from campus, 
office. My mother was going through some old albums that she came across an album of pictures of me from high school. Look at you, she sighed wistfully. You used to be so thin. It took all I had to swallow back tears that had threatened to burst, words that had threatened to fire off my tongue. Then why did you want me to lose weight? Nine. Are you gay? We were in my freshman dorm when a friend of mine asked me this, after seeing the collage of Aya Matsura printouts on the wall over my bed. It wasn't the first time I had been asked this. My earliest memory dated back to my early preteen years of using Gaia online, when the question was posed to me by a fellow forum user, an online friend who I had been casually private messaging. Are you gay? There was more to his message. He said that if I was, that was okay, that I shouldn't be ashamed or embarrassed about it that it sounded as if it was because of all the kinds of anime series I loved and because I'd been working on a sapphic romance story that I'd been telling him about. But any, but any text after those three words escaped me. I was too consumed by the waterfall that roared like white noise through my ears. I swept in a pool under my armpits and how my heart started to pound so fast, it ached so hard I was unable to breathe. The same way that I had lied in my message response to my online friend, I lied to my friend in my dorm room, trying to ignore how my face burned and flush as it had those years ago. 10. I wouldn't say I sought it out, but I kept finding myself coming back to and being drawn to lesbian content. Gianna's self and nowhere fanfic, the DVD copy of But I'm a Cheerleader tucked in between the other gay films on my cousin's bookshelf that my cousin thought no one noticed. The word lesbian and I walked alongside each other as if we were friends taking a stroll down a beach boardwalk. But I couldn't see myself in it, but there was something about it I found myself increasingly drawn to. The excitement of two girls kissing, of a love that was soft, passionate, tender, and sapphic. I discovered revolutionary girl Utena in the brief 48 hours when my parents switched from cable to Verizon Sios, which we ultimately canceled after my father couldn't stand the excessive number of channels, unable to easily find his favorite go-tos. It was nearly midnight when I was flipping channels and stumbled on the Funimation channel, playing the second to last episode of Utena. As fragmented as it was, having missed the 37 episodes that came before it, I immediately became Captain Native of Utena, as I learned more about her, piece by little piece, a tomboyish girl who, instead of wanting to be saved, vowed to be a prince herself, and who wielded a sword in her hands in the name of defending and keeping the hand of Anthe, her rose bride. Within the span of the next week, I hunted down all three nearly out-of-print DVD boxes of revolutionary girl Utena. I remember sitting in the floor of my parents' bedroom, swapping out disc after disc as I binged the series, wearing the pair of purple silk pajamas that I was upset were too snug on me, but refused to take off. I was unsure if I wanted to be with or be like Utena, a girl who seemed to defy gender roles, who cast aside her femininity in favor of wearing her school's boys' uniform, vowing to do the saving instead of waiting for someone else to save her, who unapologetically loved herself for who she was and didn't apologize to anyone for it. 11. My interest in anime eventually led to an interest in cosplaying, dressing up as characters from my favorite series, and suit led to me binding my chest. I started out binding only while I was in cosplay, but the more I cosplayed, the more I loved the look of my chest in a binder. How my size 38 chest seemed to flatten, almost disappear beneath the short pleather jacket of my survey corps uniform when I dressed as Armin Arlord or Levi Ackerman, or my Nekoma volleyball tracksuit when I became Kozume Kenma. After months of cosplaying as conventions as male characters, I decided to try binding dressed as myself. I pulled my binder above my head as I always had tucking the tight fabric down over my chest. The binder pressed against my breast and my chest and I smoothed them out, pressing my fat down into the sides, a tip in the binding community to get one's chest to appear as flat as possible, especially if you have more chest to work with. My chest now smoothed out, I pulled the t-shirt over my head, observing my new flattened chest in the mirror. My breath caught in my throat as I ran my hands down the flattened surface, the tight fabric squeezing my ribs, but I had never felt more free, the air in my lungs never tasting so crisp. And I'll stop there. Thank you, TJ. Um, audience, y'all can verbally applaud in the chat since TJ can't hear you right now. And um, and next we're gonna hear from Miguel. Miguel M. Morales grew up in Texas working as a migrant seasonal farm worker. He is a Lambda Literary Fellow and an alum of Vona. I was, I went to Vona too, sorry. Um, and an alum of Vona Voices and the Macondo Writers Workshops. Miguel's work that centers on fatness and queerness 
appears in From Macho to Mariposa, New Gay Latino Fiction, Hibernation and Other Poems by Bear Bards. Um, Imani Man, Poets Writing in the Azdulan Borderlands and The Other F Word, A Celebration of the Fat and Fierce. He is the co-editor of Pulse, Pulso, in Remembrance of Orlando, and of Fat and Queer, an anthology of queer and trans bodies and lives. Follow Miguel on social media as at Trust Miguel. Miguel? <laughs> Hello. Thank you uh, for having us here. We're so excited to be talking to people in our community, the, re the reason this book is out there. So um, I wanted to start off by reading the dedication to the book because I think that's really important. Um, this book is dedicated to the fat and queer and fat and trans community, to our elders whose work led us to this moment and to our youth who inspire us to keep moving forward. Uh, my first piece is called Legacy. And now in this pandemic, in this fight for black lives, remember that our fat and queer and fat and trans bodies when not being ignored or fetishized have always fought oppression. They've served as barricades, shields, ladders, message boards and transportation. Our fat bodies stood in front of the lines at Stonewall, crossed the bridge at Selma, went on strike in agricultural fields and in meatpacking plants, defended sacred water at Standing Rock, protected the environment and advocated for our animal friends. Our queer bodies knocked on doors, made phone calls, passed out flyers, registered people to vote, drove people to the polls and defended the right to vote. Our trans bodies chained themselves to the White House fence during the AIDS crisis, committed and were arrested for acts of civil disobedience. Our fat and queer and fat and trans bodies have been abused, assaulted, beaten, bloodied, stabbed, and shot. Our bodies have been refused housing, treatment, legality, entry into workrooms, classrooms, airplanes, and places of worship. We've marched on the March for LGBTQ rights. We've marched in the Women's March and the Youth March for Our Lives and the Latino March on Washington. We've marched to state capitals, to city hall, police stations, congressional offices. We've marched down city streets, across town, on campuses, and in protests and parades. Our fat and queer bodies have been part of every social movement, every fight, every attack on the week, every community celebration, every birth, every breath, every death. This mighty legacy of our beautiful fat and queer and fat and trans bodies, let us rise tall in our bodies. Let us continue to embrace and collude with intersectional movements, but let us not forget to raise our voices, to call on our allies, to, read out, to, to lead our marches and our parades. Let us fight for our youth and protect our elders. Let us proudly carry the weight of our fat and queer and fat and trans legacy. Um, and my last piece is called Fat Queer Poem. In this poem, you are as fat and queer as you, you are as fat as you are queer. Read this poem without worrying about your roles. Don't push away this plate, declining savory seconds. Don't wear a shirt at this fabulous pool party. You can read this poem while walking on a treadmill or dunking iced oatmeal cookies into chilled milk. This, po this fat poem doesn't want you to suck in your queer gut. It will send you a friend request to read your posts, to share its fattest selfies and curviest poses. This queer poem knows you photograph beautifully and hopes you're less inclined to filter your flaws or remove them altogether though it quietly confesses to having done both on occasion. This poem likes to spend time naked in sexual and non-sexual ways, gather, granting itself consent to be naked, fat, and queer all at once. This poem shares its body more freely than it did when it was younger and unsure of what it could offer, of what it could ask, and what it could receive from others. This 
fat palm bears scars, stretch marks, blemishes, and dimples. It's layered and lopsided. It has thick stanzas that twist and contort in surprising ways, even to itself. Its rhythm reveals different tones and textures, depending on where your eyes, hands, and lips roam. This queer poem takes up the page, takes over the page. This poem breaks lines, breaks chairs, breaks hearts. This poem is as strong as its laughter, as its anger, and as its love. This poem, you are as fat as you are queer. Thank you, Miguel. Um, I was telling the editors y'all before the rest of you got here that I just got my copy um, this weekend at Palabras Bookstore, bilingual bookstore in Phoenix. And I, so I haven't had a chance to, to read through a lot of it yet. And just hearing, um, hearing y'all read makes me feel like I might not do any of my other work tonight and just spend the rest of my night with the book. Um, so. Uh, Bruce, give me one more dose so maybe I can do a little work tonight and then pick up the book again in the morning. Um, we're going to introduce now introduce you now to Bruce Owens Grimm. Bruce is a queer ghost nerd based in Chicago. He is the co-editor of Fat and Queer. His essays and reviews have appeared in The Rumpus, Brevity's nonfiction blog, Entropy, AWP Writer's Notebook, Iron Horse Literary Review, Older Queer Voices, Ghost City Review, and elsewhere. He is a 2021 Tin House Winter Workshop alum and has attended residencies and workshops at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, Vermont Studio Center, and Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, VCCA, among others. He can be found on Twitter at Bruce Owens Grimm. Bruce, take it away. Thank you, Tigris, and thank you, uh, David and Selena. Um, so I'm gonna read from my piece, Dropping Fictions and Gaining Visibility, uh, which was published in the Rumpus uh, and started this uh, whole adventure. Um, and I also, I don't know, I get, it also feels important to me to read it, uh, especially during Pride, because I don't know if everyone has seen, but there it was a whole discussion about whether it's appropriate for kink to be involved in a celebration of pride. Um, and so I'm gonna read about kink, <laughs> um, which I think at the last reading, some people were a little like, what is he reading? But anyways, uh, here we go. Uh, so this is Dropping Fictions and Gaining Visibility. Gainer, someone who derives erotic and or sexual pleasure from the act of eating and or gaining weight. A gainer is always looking to grow, fantasizes about becoming bigger than they are currently. People on the gain may weigh themselves every day, count calories to make sure they are hitting their goal to get bigger, not maintain or lose weight. Contrary to how it usually works in our culture, losing weight is a gainer's nightmare. But a broad general definition applied to a group of people never encompasses all the variations and nuances. For example, in gainer culture, there are men who prefer to keep gaining in the realm of fantasy and pad their clothes to give the illusion of size, of fat. They can indulge in the concept of size without having to live, live it on a daily basis. When the urge strikes to be big, they stuff pillows or other materials under their clothes, or if they have the means, don a purchase padded suit. Some gainers don't consider the patterns real gainers because there's not an actual physical change to the patter's body. Those who believe this think the patterns have, it, patterns have it easy, partly because they don't have to deal with fat phobia. On the other end of the spectrum are the guys who want to be immobile. These men want to be so fat, so large that it impedes their daily lives. They want mounds of flesh cascading down their sides and so they cannot get out of bed. If they meet their goal, they may need help breathing. They may need someone to help wash and care for them. The only way they could leave their house would be to, would be, to be wheeled out. This isn't rare, but it isn't the average gainer goal either. And it's not my goal. 
The idea of someone, anyone, trying to police what is okay in any fetish is problematic. I am not here to do that. I don't judge these other kinds of gainers, but these are not my personal goals. I, too, am a gainer, and while I want to grow to a size that most civilians, a term for people who are not into the gaining scene, consider very fat or obese. I want to maintain mobility. I want to leave my house because I want the world to see how fat I am. I do not want to be a secret. Encourager. Someone who derives erotic or sexual satisfaction from participating in the growth of a gainer. They may verbally encourage a gainer by reminding them to eat, asking for updates about what they have eaten, and pushing them to eat a little more even when they are full. They may praise the gainer for growing and reward the gainer by rubbing or squeezing the gainer's belly or other areas of their bodies that have grown. They may cook or buy special foods for the gainer. They may set weight goal, gain goals with the gainer. They may actually feed the gainer, sometimes with utensils, sometimes with their hands, and in some cases, cases a funnel. Encouragers can be nurturing or disciplinary or a combination of these and other styles. The gainer wants to please the encourager, eat for them, grow for them. There is mutual satisfaction and gratification in this dynamic. Example, a barista at my neighborhood coffee shop shares my fetish. We know this about each other because there is a social media site for male gay gainers that both of us are on. And I have face and body pics on my account. He doesn't have any pictures. So when he messaged me to say hello and that he was the barista at my local coffee shop, I didn't know which barista he might be. When I went to the coffee shop later that day, I watched eavesdrop on the conversations the baristas had with each other in, a, in an attempt to discover some clue that would tell me which one he might be. It felt like a movie. And I wondered if I should have taken a donut. And the one who asked just one would be revealed as the mystery encourager. I had hopes for which one it would be. The cute one, as I called him when telling friends about him. When in fact the cute one waved at me and patted his belly, I immediately heard Meg Ryan telling Tom Hanks and you've got mail, I hoped it would be you. The barista tells me on his break that he would have known I was a gainer even without seeing me on the site because I dressed in tight shirts that accentuated my belly, sometimes just barely covering it. But I looked put together, not sloppy, my hair always done, my beard groomed, because he's an encourager, the barista notices how men who are fat accidentally or don't want to be fat, who are ashamed of being fat, hide their fat, don't know how to dress their bodies. They want people to ignore their bodies, but not me. I sit at the counter reading or writing, and he slides a sample of milkshake towards me as he walks by. I arch my back, pretending to stretch when really I am showing off my belly for him displaying the growth he is helping me achieve. He asks me if I want more to drink or to eat. I always nod and he always smiles. When I order a latte, he switches the milk from 2% to half and half to ensure maximum calorie density. When he can, he doesn't charge me for the extra things I eat or drink. Sometimes he gives me a discount. Often we never say a word to each other. No one else around us knows what we are doing, the fun we are having. We share these secret erotic experiences in public, in front of other people, and without ever touching each other. But we are both the type for whom the unspoken only satisfies for so long. We want to give voice to what is happening. We whisper questions to each other. How long have you been a gainer slash encourager? Our answers, our answers are the same for as long as either one of us can remember. He wants to know how fat I want to get. I tell him 300 pounds is my first major goal. He likes the idea of me at that size. He tells me that he thinks my frame could easily han could eat, could handle 350 pounds easily. Encouragers have always been able to imagine more than I can, but I like the idea of 350 pounds. He asks if I've ever been fed had my belly rubbed by an encourager. Yes, I say to both, but it's been a while. How long? About six months. That's too long, he says, as he walks the way to help 
another customer before I can agree. Secrets never want to stay hidden, even if that's part of their initial appeal. There is an erotic charge in the secret that the barista and I share, but the day arrives when he wants to hang out after he's finished work. I'm nervous and glad that he suggested this because there is a power. Although there is power in secrecy, too often that power transforms into shame. We meet in the park at the end of the street. The illicitness is no longer enticing as I think about the history of gay men cruising parks because there was no other way to meet. He brings me cookies from the coffee shop. I eat them as we talk books we love. The barista wants to touch my belly and I let him. It feels good, thrilling and relaxing at the same time. Despite his hands being cold as he runs his, runs his hand along the edge of my belly, squeezing my overhang. Then he pulls my shirt back down. I have to stop, he says. The barista has a boyfriend, a civilian. He loves him. They might get married. He already feels un unfaithful. I understand, I say. I ask him if he plans, plans to tell his boyfriend about this fetish. He shakes his head. He wouldn't understand. You know this won't go away, I tell him. I know, he shrugs. I have to see if I can live with that. We spend a few hours discussing the rarity of randomly finding someone with this fetish out in the wild, as he puts it. Someone that you see on a regular basis. We discuss whether or not gaining and encouraging is something you can incorporate into your daily life. For him, it has to stay separate, a fantasy. For him, it has to stay a secret. I'll stop right there. <laughs> so Bruce, um, I'm, you said that piece was actually from your Rumpus series that inspired the anthology, is that correct? Correct. Do you wanna give um, the audience a little tease about what your piece in the anthology is about? Sure. So um, the second piece is called The Haunted House. Um, and it's actually, this is one of the pieces where uh, fair use, uh, the lack of fair use in the UK came into play because I, um, in it, I quote uh, parts from The Haunting of Hill House and can have those in there. Um, but uh, essentially it's about my experience with another encourager um, who uh, we both love haunted houses uh, and ghosts and all of that. Um, so um, it's also sort of about the danger of falling in love um, and uh, me trying to avoid falling in love with this encourager who loves ghosts. Um, and let me tell you, that didn't work out great. <laughs> <laughs> what are, so we'll, we'll let folks get the book and read that one. And then um, just can, can the three of y'all just say as, so audience, this is a great time to queue up some questions in the chat. And as you do that, I'll just pose one question for our um, editors today. Is there, um, what are some of the other topics? You know, obviously fat and queer is the umbrella, right? But hearing from the three of you, we've heard about um, teenage dieting, we've heard about cosplay and anime, we've heard about pandemic survival, we've heard about um, gainer encourager culture. What else is covered? What are some of the things that come up in, you know, from these 30 other writers that are in the book? Uh, we have a couple of pieces about um, people being taken to like Weight Watchers when they were young and just how the, that trauma um, really played out in the rest of their lives and how they're trying to, you know, come to terms with it and find the celebration of being who they are and the size that they are. They're, I mean, just, just the fact that there are, you know, 30 plus people in this book and each one of them has their own intersectionalities and they bring it to the page. I, I think we have so many topics. I mean, we would spend the rest of our time just like going down a checklist of what, what we cover. But I think one of the things we really wanted to do was be inclusive and get people of color, diverse people and neurodiverse people and disabled people because being fat and queer just isn't being cis, you know, white, queer male. So um, we really wanted to reach beyond that. And I think we I think we succeeded. I, we could have, could we have done, had more diversity? Yeah, but I mean, we were already at 300 plus pages. I mean, 
we would love to have a fat book as well, but you know, maybe save that for volume two or something. Um, to piggyback off of Miguel, um, there's also just some incredibly beautiful, and I, I remember it the most in some of our poetry pieces, um, pieces about food. Um, and there's this also incredibly wonderful piece from one of our contributors. Um, and we had an event with them a couple weeks ago, and they were saying that when they were thinking of writing for Fat and Queer, they wanted to really approach um, how is it that they can so easily love their partner who is also fat and queer, and but that love for their partner did not necessarily translate to the love for themselves. So that is, their, their piece is just absolutely exceptional, seeing how it's not only a celebration of their love for their partner, but also how food comes into play of it. Um, that is a really great um, piece. Um, on a lighter note, there's kind of like a reoccurring theme of like queer awakenings. Um, there's one piece that talks about like the Terminator and another one that talks about like cruel intention. So for me, I felt like as I was reading these pieces, I'm like, okay, I have some like movies I now need to queue up since they're apparently queer. Um, <laughs> well, and Linda Hamilton appears at least twice in the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so Linda Hamilton, Terminator 2 was very formative for <laughs> people. <laughs> Um, that's great. Bruce, did you have anything you wanted to add on that question about just what some of the other specific topics are that come up in the book? Um, we, we do have uh, a couple other pieces um, that are also about uh, gaining and fetish in that way, which I um, was really glad that we had those because that community is so so secretive and people are so so afraid to uh write and talk about that i mean i was too like the the rumpus piece took me a year from the time i pitched it to they said hey we want to run this next month <laughs> or in two months um i just lived avoiding writing it um and then i wrote it in a month um but um yeah we have that we have uh I mean, I, th I think awakening is a, is like a really, uh, like, a, I don't want to say repetitive, it appears multiple times. Um, you know, because one of the things that uh, we came across in this book is that, yeah, when we announced it, everybody was like, yes, I want this book. I need this book. This is a book I wish I had as a kid, but um uh, you know, it, it took some, uh, we didn't get a lot of submissions right away because people n wanted to read it, but they didn't necessarily know how to write about it or were afraid to write about um, these topics, um, the intersection of these topics. And um, so hopefully if we would do another one that would be different, um, that we would be able, that people would be like, hey, here, <laughs> we, have, we have these 30 people who are really willing to open themselves up in that way. Um, you know, but, you know, I guess there's like some like people, you know, who live in such a fat phobic world. We all grew up in, in families and in uh, environments where, um, you know, being fat was is, and this still is, but in a lot of places considered like the worst thing like that could possibly happen to you. You know, um, like when we're talking about the pandemic weight gain, like oh my god, I gained five pounds, or you know, I work in a place that sells pastries, and people come in, oh, I I shouldn't do that, I can't do that, oh, oh, you know, it's like shut up and eat the damn cookie, you know, like. Um, you know, because it's not for health stuff or whatever, you know, it's like, whatever. They're like these super skinny, like rich people and they know they're like, afraid to eat a cookie and like eat the damn cookie. You just worked out for five hours. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll stop right there before I go on a rant about rich people and their exercise routines. <laughs> okay, well, well, we'll look for your next piece about that, Bruce. Um, Thanks, Tiger. <laughs> So a couple of questions from the chat. Um, well, first of all, we want to clarify um, what a question about clarifying whether the international publication meant that the book is actually available in other languages. No, it's only available in English right now. Oh, sorry. And um, 
do we know if there's a does like does us buying many, many copies of it help ensure that it will be translated into other languages? Do we know if there's a plan? Or our, maybe our, <laughs> our publisher by day might have some answers for us about uh, that? I mean, to, I mean, well, TJ, uh, I would say, but buying lots of copies of the book wouldn't hurt. Uh, we also want to get an audio ver book version of, of it um, for, you know, some people to prefer that and for accessibility reasons. So that would also help with that. Um, yeah, I was going to say that, you know, in terms of getting it translated into uh, other languages, that's typically um, a subsidiary rights thing. So that has to do with um, typically if publishers from other countries essentially want to like purchase the book to get it translated into their respective language. So um, currently um, we do not have any news and updates about that since the book just recently came out. But certainly purchasing more copies and telling your friends about it um, will not hurt. Um, <laughs> so you heard the assignment community. It's not just that it helps these editors and these writers. It's also that the, when you rack up the numbers, it's more likely that other people will option it for translation. So get out there and do that work for the rest of the world by getting your copy. Um, is the end um, is why do you think this was the right time for the book? This is a question from Julia. Why was this the right time for such a groundbreaking book? I think I think people have been doing the work um, on fatness and people have been doing the work on queerness. And now the, the intersection was coming together. And, and there are other books coming out about fatness and queerness. We just happened to be one of the first because I think we were seeing a trend. We were seeing like, this is, if this is my my idea about like how how I write stuff is like I if I think this I wonder if other people are thinking this too, and then I kind of like let my little bionic woman hearing <laughs> listen to conversations. I'm like, yeah, I'm hearing conversations about this, and so that's when I I said to Bruce, you know, we need to do an anthology. This is let's do it, and and that was you know two years ago, and and it was taking us a while to get our feet and get going, and I was. The, the competition in me was like, someone's gonna beat us to it. This is such a good idea and people wanted it so much, someone's gonna beat us to, to, the, to the publishing date. And thank goodness, you know, TJ came in and got us all together and we, you know, got our wagons in a row and we, we put it out there. But there are a lot more books coming out uh, from single authors and I think probably uh, some other anthologies, um, you know, kind of just published today that talk about fatness, that have queerness in them, or queerness that have some fatness in them, but I, right now we are the, I think the only one, uh, you know, this magnitude of this, um, this project, this thing, so. Is, um, sorry, go ahead. If you have more thoughts on that, please. Uh, I mean, I was simply gonna say that this book is overdue. Um, so um, that's why it was the right time, because <laughs> it's like, you know, as we keep hearing from uh, readers, like, you know, they wish they'd had this when they were kids um, or young teenagers, whatever. I don't know. When I was a kid, I wouldn't have had access to uh, a book, but that's a story for another time. <laughs> what um, is the anthology? This is a question from Len. Is the anthology intergenerational? Basically, are there older writers included? Uh, I'm 53 years old, so yes. <laughs> and there's a couple of other writers who are around my age. So we have people who are in their 50s and 60s who are writers. I think we also have some younger people who are in their 20s. Um, I don't think we have any teen writers, but um, it, is, it is generational. I mean, if you look, if you read through the entire book and the, and the stories, there's different reference points. People, some people refer the 90s and some people were, you know, reference the 80s. You know, I referenced Selma and Stonewall, so, <laughs> you know, um, so yeah, I think, I think on that term, you'll, you'll get a lot of information from the different generations, but you'll also learn about how, how fat and queer people came to find themselves in those different eras. I think that's really fascinating, you know, because this book came out at this time, but it was being written for generations. So, um, yeah. 
Well, and I just want to say too, you know, we talk a lot on our webinars about the history of the fat activist movement and, and different, you know, things that things that happened that shaped the world around fat people and fat activism and um, fat liberation. And I think, you know, for NAFA specifically, we're constantly um, these days working on creating more intersectional spaces, more intersectional events, um, you know, holding an intersectional perspective about what fat liberation should be. And we have a lot of work to do to make up for the way that that wasn't always done in NAFA's history. But there have been LGBTQ IAP plus people involved in this movement from the very beginning. Um, it's not as obvious or documented in organizations like NAFA, but it's very obvious and documented around the work of the fat underground, which was really instrumental in the early 70s and around some of the, um, particularly around some of the women and feminist groups who were doing, um, you know, fat liberation work through in feminist spaces and so like when you look at this, this sort of long history um fat and queer goes together all the time we just haven't always talked about them together um and so it's really great to have this unique work that is doing this and you know to build on like all those things that really have always been part of part of both movements <laughs> you know nafa so you mentioned um you know, referencing Selma and Stonewall, like NAFA's founded in 1969, it's the same, it's the same year as the Stonewall Rebellion. And so there are lots and lots of parallels. Um, do we have other questions from the chat? Yes, how has, um, how has the book been received at bookstore events? Are y'all doing in-person bookstore events yet or doing virtual ones? What's going on with that? And how are people reacting? Well, all of our events have been virtual so far. Um, we've had really good turnout. Um, at those events, um, I was I was able to the um, one of the local stores here in Chicago, Women Children's First, where we had our first uh, reading slash launch event. They uh, they had the book in uh, window display for Trans uh, Day of Visibility. Um, so I had to go see it after people told me. <laughs> I was like, "There's no way I'm not gonna." go see this and take pictures of it and then they just had it like on the table it was like just walk in a bookstore and there it is um and so um i'm gonna take that as it's been received really well um and it's also on like uh libraries have been really great for us too um uh, i got a little teary i had on the train the other day when i found out that the chicago public library has fat and queer um, and that a bunch of people have it on hold already. And um, I just want to go take pictures of it on the show. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, well, it's been received. The, the, re the reception of this book has been way beyond what I even allowed myself to imagine or dream. Um, you know, you, you hope and people say, oh, yeah, this is the book we need. And then it comes out and there's just this tidal wave of great of goodness and people loving it. And um, it is exhausting in all the best ways. <laughs> and it, it's really like nice seeing that more places are normalizing doing virtual events too. Um, I mean, for us, it's incredibly um, beneficial because we, we all live like across the United States. Um, so it would be incredibly difficult for us to do in-person events like, like this where it, it's all three editors together in the room. Um, but the great thing is, is that, you know, we are reaching out to other bookstore venues. So stay in touch on, um, keep your eyes peeled on the Pat and Core website and our, on our Twitter and Instagram accounts um, for information as, you know, we're hoping to have some more events as the summer rolls on. Um, but we're also looking to do um, like events in certain states. And then if there's contributors from that area, then that's an opportunity to have like those contributors join in. Um, which we have done for um, our past two events at Women and Children's First and Loyalty Bookstore. Um, and, you know, to piggyback off of Bruce, like it's it's just been incredibly well received. Like yesterday, um, someone uh, who works at Powell's was like, hey, do you have a queer book coming out for Pride Month? Do you want me to check to make sure that we have it? And we had this great conversation on Twitter and it ended up with them, you know, they're like, oh, we have been meaning to order this. I ordered this, our copies will be in at the end of the week. And it, 
the internet's phenomenal. It's just, it was just such like an incredibly heartwarming conversation. Um, but this is also making me realize that I like really need to get out of my apartment and go to a physical bookstore because aside from like my own apartment and seeing like my friends who are like buying the book and taking pictures of it, I haven't seen it out like in the wild myself. Um, but uh, from from the folks who are picking it up or like seeing it at their bookstores, um, I feel like it's it's been nothing but um, joy and such incredible great words from everyone. Are there any particular bookstores that y'all want to mention? We had a question about ordering it from Amazon, which of course you can do, um, but are there any particular, and of course you can order it from the publisher um, or from the Fat and Queer website, but are there any particular bookstores that have been super supportive of you or that you feel are super supportive of queer or fat or both communities that um, you mentioned Powell's, which is in Portland, right? Right. Uh, um, and I mentioned Palabras in Phoenix, anybody else? Uh, I mean, the two bookstores, we just mentioned Loyalty and Women and Children's First. They've yeah. both been super great to us. Um, there's another bookstore in um, Chicago that is owned by uh, two Black women called Semicolon, um, which is also a really great bookstore here. We're really, uh, we're, we're really uh, uh, have a lot of great bookstores in Chicago, <laughs> really. Um, but I like them particularly, and that's, I order a lot from them too, so. We have a bunch of um, links to diff, like to ind independent bookstores, uh, not just Amazon and Barnes and Noble on our website. So you can order it through that or a bookshop. Um, right now our publisher has a deal that if you buy a book through their website, you can get another book at 50% off. So you could buy our book and another book or two of our books or you know whatever. So you, you might want to look through their catalog. It's a, Jessica Kinsley um, Publishers. So and it's on our on our Twitter and um, Instagram. Great. It's through, the whole, great. it's through all five months. So yeah, BOGO. Th throughout June for in celebration of Pride. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and also all of you in your bios had references to, um, to organizations or, um, or groups that uh, I know of as groups that ha help writers um, write and sustain artists. Um, do you want to talk about any of those? I'm sure we have some aspiring writers or working writers in the audience who would love to hear more about those. I know about Vona. That's why I got so excited. I had read it in your bio before, but I forgot. And then when I saw it, I was like, my people. Um, Vona is a writer's workshop specifically for writers of color. Are there other ones that y'all would like to talk about or highlight for us? Um, obviously, um, there is the, the Lambda Literary Foundation. They have a emerging LGBTQ writers um, summer session that they do. It's a week long, and I participated that in tw uh, twice for uh, YA and genre writing. And it's just a fantastic way to get queer people together. And that is really one of the first places where I met this beautiful woman uh, of size. And she just had the reddest lipstick, and she was just owning it. And she when she came, you know, off, off, the, off the, the bus and, and loaded all her bags, she took off this, her seatbelt extender and stuck it in her purse. And she had taken, you know, she had one for her, her Southwest flight or whatever flight. She was like, no, honey, this is mine. I didn't take it. This is, I, this is mine. And I'm like, she carries her own seatbelt extender for flying on airplanes. That's genius. Because, you know, when I fly, I'm, that's my thing. It's like, I'm always worried about, oh, am I going to fit on the plane? And I do, but it's just that fat thing that's in your head. But um, yeah, there's Lambda. Um, I was part of Macondo Writers Workshop. That's for um, it's, it's geared towards Latino Latinx writers, but it takes everyone. Um, then I'll, of course, Vona, and um, Bruce has been part of some residencies. Yeah, I mean the most recent one was was Tin House, which um, was a super amazing experience, um, and uh, an example of persistence when it comes to writing. <laughs> Um, because I, I've been applying not continuously, but off and on for at least 10 years. Um, uh, and then this was the first, uh, time I got in, uh, and was like, am I dreaming? Am I like, um, and then it was just, it was, I had such high expectations and it exceeded all those. Cause it's just such a great community. Um, and they're just open to so 
men, you know, like they want like, how can we help you tell your best story? It's not like sort of going into like some places where it's like, you have a kind of story that we like, you know, or like type of writer or whatever. Um, and then um, I really, uh, uh, oh my God, why can't I think of the full name? The Provincetown one is, um, was also really amazing for, and um, had, is really supportive of especially queer writers. Um, and so is Tin House, they're both uh, very supportive of all that. Um, but, you know, Provincetown, and I was there during Bear Week, so that was <laughs> interesting, um, I'll say. <laughs> um, so they, echo, they did their part for the fat and queer. <laughs> okay. And to just echo Bruce's message of, um, you know, just kind of being persistent and keeping at it, uh, likewise, it took me like I think five applications for me to get um into Lambda and you know as as Miguel said like when I went I I never had been to such a physically and like emotionally and mentally safe space where I felt like I could be unapologetically queer before um and it was also just um from like a writing perspective just I've I had never been in a more group surrounded by such incredibly talented, diverse writers. So um, I can't highly recommend Lambda enough. Um, and this isn't um, a writing retreat, but one thing that has kind of um, keeping my head above water uh, in quarantine when I feel like I'm losing my way with writing is uh, there is this um, uh, writing, um, I don't want to say, but they're a group, they're, they're a workspace. So they're called Paragraph New York. Um, and they're primarily a workspace, um, like a co-working space in New York where writers can meet up, um, but they now have a virtual membership. So uh, that gives you access to their Slack channel. They have monthly writing groups. Um, so if you find that you know, you're, you really need that sense of community to ground you in your writing um, and to like, find your people, um, that has been like extremely having just such an incredibly profound positive um, effect on me during quarantine and I can't recommend them enough. I don't know that there's any program or residency that is for fat fat people, fat bodies, fat writing. That that would be interesting to know. Who, I mean, I'm sure they're all open to it, but then some places are inaccessible because of your size. Um, but it would be interesting to, to kind of put together, you know, a list of what residencies are out there? I'm applying for residencies now because it's like residency season. They're they're applying, you know, for year you know 2022 because they're all hopefully getting back together. And I'm putting it on on my you know vacation. I'm going to be doing writing about fatness and queerness, and I just want to put it out there because that's what I'm going to be doing. And um, so I think probably more people will want space to explore this because sometimes you just need to get out of your physical area. I mean we're all like kind of locked in, but even out of your town or somewhere like they don't know you. So that way you can like really explore what it means to be fat and queer or just your fatness. Um, so if you want to, you know, pursue writing, look for residencies and, and just be really honest and say, I want to explore this as a project. I don't know what it's going to lead to, but it's going to be creative. And this is what I want to do. Cause I think that's a unique enough, uh, situation that people will say yeah there's there's not a lot of writing or space for that happening and they would like to be the one who does it so i don't know that's what i think and i'd also recommend vermont studio center um which was my very first residency um for many reasons i mean there's a great sense of community there and you get your studio but the food is amazing <laughs> 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 the food was so good. <laughs> the food was really good at Hedgebrook Women's Writers Retreat, which I went to, I don't know, 15 years ago or something. I'm sure it's still amazing food there too. We just compare food notes for the rest of the webinar. Um, <laughs> it's, it's actually, um, <clears throat> it's actually like, but this is the kind of, this is the reason why having spaces where we are, we know we're in community with other fat positive people is like fat people talking about food with other fat people who are fat positive is a totally different experience 
than fat people talking about food with people of any size who are not fat positive. And right. that's why, you know, something like what Miguel just mentioned, like a, a writer space, an artist cre creative space um, that is specifically done through a fat lens is really important. An audience, if you have resources like that, that you're aware of, that you're not aware of, um, just use the contact form at nafa.org to let us know about them so that we can, um, we can share them with community. I'd like, to, I, I like to, to mention that um, there were a couple of writers who we got some of their work and we were working with them and they were, were like, you know, this needs more fatness in it. So we would write them back and say, you know, could you just be a little more obvious about being fat? And they were like, oh, my God, this is why <laughs> we need, you know, a fat editor who knows what we're talking about. I mean, Tiff, uh, that, you got that reaction from a, a contributor who you're working with. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that. That like so. If what what we're hearing, community is right. Your actual fatness, not some sanitized fatness that you think editors want, because there are people who want it, and there are people who will do it, and there are people who will put it out all over the world. Um, um, we and, have. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say actually too. Um, like one thing that we did when we were still accepting submissions, we kind of build hype is that we would do um, weekly writing sessions. So it was actually was a virtual room where uh, writers who were fat and queer who were interested in submitting to the anthology could kind of come in. Um, it was kind of like a quiet writing time where we would write, but they could also, you know, speak up and ask us questions. Um, so Miguel, are you saying like, oh, like, I wonder, are there any like fat and queer, like, you know, writing spaces? I'm like, maybe we should bring that back. Maybe we should bring that fat back. And queer spin off yeah. from project um yeah but but that was in, incredibly um like very it was very nice having that to ground us um because that also too was like right at the height of the pandemic um mm -hmm. in like may and in the summer um so yeah. Yeah. and we should also say that we nafa offers um at a few different points during the year, the opportunity for people to apply for small grants um, as part of our um, fat, uh, FAT project fund. And if you were interested in starting something like a workshop in your local area or a virtual workshop, that might be something that you consider applying for the next time you see our grant. Oh. Coming around. A couple of months before, before the next one, but, um, and I mean, that goes for y'all as the fan for editors, <laughs> but it also goes for any of you out there listening who would like to do, or who would like to build that and something else, right? This is an excellent example, and I, I don't want to decenter the queerness here, but I just, just want to remind you that like, it's also an ex excellent example of ways we can do this with our other identities. Like this is part of the intersectionality too, is like, what's the next fat and anthology? And, you know, as, uh, as these folks mentioned at the beginning, you know, they've put together some resources, they've done some um, workshops around helping people learn how this process works. So all of us can do these kinds of things. So pay attention for, um, you know, follow them all individually and follow the Fat and Queer book so that the next time they offer that resource to the community, you can learn those things and then we can be having a fat and whatever um, webinar featuring you. Um, it's we need to we do need to wrap up so I'm going to combine the last question from the audience with the with our sort of traditional last question to the panel so <clears throat> Um, so someone in the chat wanted to know if there are other fat and queer writers that you want to recommend. And then we always end by asking if there's something we didn't ask you about that you really want to make sure that our audience knows. So if you would all just take that, those two questions in turn, um, and we'll wrap up that way. Well, I, I mean, I guess for... I mean, fat and queer writers, I mean, there's Carmen Maria Machado, who's in the book, uh, Aubrey Gordon, your fat friend, has her own book about uh, called, what we'll talk about when we talk about fat, um, which is really good. Um, I don't know, there's so, I mean, queer, this queer writer, he's not fat, but queer writers, if, if y'all haven't read Paula Sicki, read Paula Sicki, uh, Marcos Gonzalez. Uh, has a really amazing book out called Pedro's Theory, which, uh, and uh, I could, most of Phoebos who's queer, but also not fat. Um, 
You know, I, I think uh, it's it's kind of difficult to kind of rattle off names because some people, some of our fat and queer writers don't really identify as being fat, but they write about, they're, they're subliminally putting their fatness in there. So they're kind of moving down the fat and queer continuum. And some of them were actually working on projects right now. So when 2022, we're going to see more fat and queer books or books that have the intersectional fat and. So those things are in the works. So those those are things to look forward to. And then we each are working on projects as well. And I'm sure our fatness and queerness and transness will, will find homes in those pages as well. Um, yeah, and I would, I would just have to shout out, um, I write a lot of YA, so I kind of live in that cool. realm yeah. of the literary sphere um, and on Twitter. Uh, so I have to shout out um, Mason Deaver and Julie Murphy. Um, really, Ju Julie Murphy's books, um, really, that was just like kind of the first time I ever really saw fat characters being presented up in front, um, like, you know, on the cover of a book. And there's there's just incredibly phenomenal um, representation being like so loud and proudly represented on the cover of young adult um, books these days. So I highly recommend um, checking her out and, you know, perhaps browsing the young adult section of your local bookstore the next time you go on a bookstore adventure. Um, and another great book that just recently came out as well that I have to recommend is A uh, Body Talk by Kate Reno. Um, and it's kind of part book and then also part handbook about um, really reflecting on yourself and your relationship with your body to be proud of your body and to kind of be body positive. Um, for the sake of transparency, um, you know, despite editing Fat and Queer this year, especially, there's just something about it where I'm kind of going through like ups and downs where I'm having incredibly good body positive days. And then, you know, I still need to bring myself back up again and just being able to connect and see the community that's responding to this anthology is really what's putting a smile back on my face and bringing me, you know, back up from those uh, incredibly down days. Um, so. Yeah, I think that's a really great point TJ makes is that, you know, that we all are going to have those up and down days. Like a lot of, I've had people say, well, you know, you, so you came out as fat, so like you must not worry about that anymore. It doesn't bother you or you don't have like low self-esteem days or whatever. I'm like, hell no. Like I'm all over the place all the time. Like it, I maybe bounce back quicker from it than I did before. Um, but it, I mean you just can't help it. Like it's going to happen. And, um, you know, I think my advice to people would just be like, don't get too down on yourself about it. Like, it's okay. You know, like, um, so yeah. <laughs> um, Miguel, did you answer this one? Sorry. Oh, you, you, you mentioned some writers in the upcoming writer coming out in 2022. Um, well, we, we need to, um, we love being here with you. We need to wrap up. Um, we have talked a little bit with the editors about the possibility of doing a second event with some of the other readers. So please stay with some of the other writers from the anthology. So please stay tuned. Yeah. Um, that may be coming from us. And if it doesn't come from us, you want to make sure that you are following them on their various social media um, so that and following the book so that you can be aware of when they have other events coming up. If you um, heard a bookstore you loved or thought of a bookstore you loved, you should ask them to carry this book. You should ask them to host events with these editors um, and the same with your local libraries. And we should be doing that for, um, for fat and queer and for fat books and queer books um, whenever we can. Thank you all for being here with us. Thank you, TJ, um, Miguel, and Bruce for bringing us your, your art and your wisdom around the process. And uh, thank you, audience. And, and thank you to Selena and David from Pro Bono ASL. We will see you next time, everybody. Take care. <laughs>